Welcome to another episode of White Ball. My name is Arshita and I'm the director of business advances at White Labs. We are a list of agencies specializing in SaaS and e-commerce marketing. And my today's guest is Brian. He's the co-founder and CEO of Green Path. Now, Green Path is an online marketplace connecting homeowners with lawn moving professionals that own their business. A big welcome to you, Brian, and thanks for taking time out for us. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Now, uh, let's start with a brief overview of Green Power. We'd love to hear from you. As mission in the lawn care industry, what inspired you to create Green Power and how has the company evolved since its inception? Yeah, so Green Power is an online marketplace that connects homeowners or people who rent a home with gardeners, lawn care professionals, landscaping contractors, basically people to maintain the outside of the home. And in Green Power, it's the largest network of lawn care services that you can hire in the United States. And it started off 10 years ago. I guess you could say it's a 10-year overnight success. But now around 300,000 people every week are using the app and website to get lawn mowing services done. I actually started Green Power because my first business was a lawn care business. I started mowing grass in high school as a way to make extra cash and stuck with that little lawn mowing business little by little over about a 15-year period of time built it to around 150 employees. And then in 2013, it was acquired by a national company in the lawn care industry. And so after I sold that, I took some time off and I was fairly confident after looking at what Airbnb and Uber were doing in 2014, I thought somebody's going to build a marketplace for lawn mowing services so you can hire them very easily. Why can't that be me? And so I recruited two co-founders and we started working on the idea and never looked back. That's brilliant. And I uh, would love to know, uh, how does Green Pad differentiate itself um, in the online marketplace for non care services? And what challenges or gaps uh, in the market did Green Pad aim to address? Yeah, so there's no shortage of places where you can look online and get names and phone numbers of service providers. So if you need a home cleaner or you need a house painter or you need a lawn care service, you can go online, you can go to Craigslist or Facebook or Yelp, or in the United States, we have Thumbtack, Home Advisor, Angie's List. These are really large directories where you can search for contractors and get an endless num list of names and phone numbers. But you still have to manually poll these people. You have to call them, you have to figure out what their uh, availability is, you have to figure out what their pricing is. Maybe there might be some reviews about them, but you don't really know if they'll show up. You don't really know if they're any good. And so most of the process is done still like it was in 19, 1990, where you're manually going through the, the headache of, of, of wrangling this contractor to come out and take care of the job for you. Green Pal is the only solution where you can put your address in and you'll get five quotes back within a minute. And you can read reviews and read stats around how often do they show up on time, how often do they get booked a second time, things like that. And then you can hire the best fit that you want to work with directly through the website. And then if it goes well, you can push a button and then they come out every week or every two weeks, whatever you decide. And so you go from, I don't know anybody, I don't know how much is this, this should cost to somebody's coming to do it tomorrow and they're going to show up every week thereafter. It's the only solution that that does that. While we compete more with the status quo than other online uh, ways to get this done, we've differentiated ourselves by being the only end-to-end -end solution for this chore. Okay. Okay. And I'm sure, like, because the use is a SaaS platform, like the user experience is one of the most critical factors. I would love to know, like, how exactly is the user experience for the homeowners and lawn care professionals? on your platforms and how has the technology been leveraged to simplify the process, booking and managing lawn care services through Green House? Yeah, it's not enough to make something just a little more convenient. It's not enough to make something just a little more easier to get done. It's got to be 10 times better. It's got to be, it's got to be drastically better or else nobody's going to use the product. So we've always looked for ways every single step of the way from, um, you know, if you're a homeowner, okay, I need to get, I need to get pricing done. Okay. So how do we get prices uh, back to the homeowner in 60 seconds or less? Okay. Let's just spend six months on that. And then, okay. When I hire them, they don't necessarily show up on the day I want. So how do we architect the platform and the rules of the platform to 
and uh, to motivate service providers to show up on the day that the homeowner wants. And then, okay, they did an okay job, but they didn't do a great job. Okay, so how do we incentivize contractors to, to, to do a great job on the property? And then, and it's on. So every little step of the way, we've looked for ways to craft the product, to, cre- to, to build the marketplace to where it, it incentivizes participants in the marketplace to, to, to act in that way. And uh, technology has a lot to do with it. User experience has a lot to do with it, but also architecting the marketplace in such a way where the rules to use it lead you towards that outcome. And it's a balance between carrot and stick. We use the carrot to try to entice service providers to act in a certain way. And we use the stick to reprimand or demote or expel them from the platform when they don't meet up to the expectations of what the platform and what the marketplace requires. And so it's always a a mix of all these things of how do we leverage technology such as very quick payments, very quick response times for when people are interacting with our product. How do we leverage things like publicly available data around size of properties and things of that sort and Google Maps and Google Street View imagery and things like that to help speed up the process. Zillow has a bunch of information that we use. How do we leverage all of this technology? How do we package it up in such a way where the user experience is just so much easier to do it this way than the old way? And then how do we architect the marketplace to where things run smoother on our marketplace versus versus the old way? So it's a combination yeah. of all those things. That's great. And because you have significant number of users on both your web platform as well as your app, what's your typical conversion rate optimization process looks like? You're always looking at one piece of the user journey. So there's the way we look at it is a funnel for get, and then in the middle there's keep, and then there's another funnel for grow. So get, keep, grow is how we look at it. So how do we get new users into the platform? How do we get the word out? How do we be where they are when they're looking for a gardener? How do we activate them in such a way that, that, that makes sense for them, not selling them, but architecting our value proposition in such a way that makes sense to them. And then once we have them, how do we keep them? How do we make sure they're happy? That's probably the most important piece. How do we make sure that they stick around and how do we make sure that they use the product for as long as they're in their home because if you, you use it once, you should use it forever. And so that's, we're all the time trying to figure out ways to keep the people that use the product. And then the other piece is grow. How do we, now we've got X number of users using the platform. How do we leverage that user base to get their neighbors on the platform? Because this business is, is based on routes and route density and route optimization. A contractor doesn't want to come 15 minutes over onto your side of town And just mow your yard. He wants to mow your yard and five more yards on your street. So we're always looking for ways to leverage the user base to grow. And and so they refer their neighbors and bring their neighbors on board because that's how we, that's how we saturate the route for the service provider and make them more money with less headache. That makes sense. And any specific campaign that really worked for for this particular particular objective that you get the neighbors as well and not yeah, we last year introduced a partnership where we would give fifty uh, percent off the first mowing if they refer their neighbor, and the service provider would uh, would offer half of that, so they would share that 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 discount with us. So that worked worked well, but it was very clunky. It was very very hand cranking, very hands on. We had to we had to, a lot of it was run with spreadsheets and in a very manual process. So we're in the we're in the process now of streamlining that. We did it in three markets. We're in over a hundred markets, but we picked three of our best markets and ran that campaign and it worked out really well, but now we're building all of the back end to, to make that run a lot smoother. That's, that's correct. I'm really interested to know a bit more about your bidding system and how exactly does that work and what benefit does it turn off for us to both homeowners as well as lawn care professionals and uh, somewhere around what strategies have been employed to ensure a fair and competent bidding uh, among the service providers. Yeah, we really want to be the, uh, I guess you could you know, like like a market maker of what lawn care services should cost. And so when you come onto the platform and you want to get your lawn mowed and you want to get weekly lawn mowing services, you get five quotes back from contractors nearby you. That is the the spot price of what it costs to mow your yard. It, five, 20 different contractors have looked at it. Five have gotten their bid into the system. 
And this is what the fair market value price is. And it's like a lot of a lot of startups have tried to tackle this in such a way where the platform sets the price. And they say, no, we believe that it's a $45 lawn mowing. No one person could ever know that because there's new market entrance into the market. There, there's contractors leaving the market. There's labor issues on a very local level. There's weather conditions. It could be raining for two weeks and everybody's behind. There could be fuel issues where fuel has skyrocketed and now contractors need more money to to recu recuperate the that, that cost. There's all of these conditions where no one person really knows that. And so we believe the bidding system is the best way to understand, okay, this is what it costs this week to get this done. And this is the fair market price for it. And you arrived at that in a very efficient way rather than having to do it the old way of calling, leaving voicemails. And then also, if you hire this price, they'll show up and do it. That's another piece of it. When we really, when we learned in the early days, we thought our value proposition was to deliver the cheapest price. But actually, the value proposition is to deliver the fair price where it'll actually get done. Because what is a bid, Matt? What good is an estimate or a bid or a quote? If the contractor isn't going to show up on Thursday and do it before your party on Thursday afternoon. So that's what we set out to do. And we made a bet early on that an auction bidding type system was the best way to do it. And, and we have yet to figure out a better way to do it. We still believe that's the best way. Gotcha. Wait, let's talk SEO now. Um, okay. you know, um, how is Green Pal uh, approach SEO to enhance this online visibility? I see that that's one of the biggest channels for your own RDI uh, traffic. And would love to know some insights into the key strategies that SEO strategies that have basically contributed to your success. Yeah, we learned really early on when we weren't profitable, we weren't making any money, and we wasted all of our money on paid channels. We We wasted all of our little bit of seed capital that we pulled together across the founders on Google AdWords and Facebook and, and other paid channels and just never could figure out a way to, to make it unit economic positive where we would spend X to get a customer and make it back in, in 12 months or less, hopefully. Never could figure out a way. And after beating our head against the wall for a year, two years, we decided, you know what, we're going to play the long game and we're just going to develop the best content we can about lawn care services in every town in the United States. And we're mm -hmm. going to interview these contractors and we're going to, we're going to talk to them and we're going to figure out what makes their business different. And we're going to do little write-ups about them, then bring them into the platform and let them do transactions. And then based on those transactions, rank them in such a way and create content around that. If you live in Lincoln, Nebraska, you type lawn care services nearby me in Lincoln, Nebraska, our landing page pops up as one of the top five choices you can look at. And so we made that bet really early on, probably year two. And it really was a bet the company decision because to, in order to compete in SEO, it, it has to be part of the exhaust of the company, the core competency of what the company is doing. And it's not like you can build a product or a marketplace and then sprinkle some SEO all over the top of it. It doesn't work that way. The SEO has to, the organic search strategy has to come within. It's part of the product. It's part of what the company is doing. It's, it's like the SEO has a seat at the table in every discussion. And that's how it started for us. And it was an early bet that we made. And it was a good bet because now that's how we get 60, 70% of new people that come in to, to use the product is just through a good, good old fashioned Google search, lawn mowing services, grass cutting service nearby me in Buffalo, New York. And then we pop up as an option and they can check us out. Makes sense. And because we're investing so much on the content front, how exactly your uh, approach looks like uh, when it comes to generating a new content and optimizing an existing piece of content on the site? Yeah, you're always... One thing about SEO is I've got a little bit of ADD and it's great because SEO is always changing. And so you're always... <laughs> You're, there's never a dull moment. And so you're always looking for ways to, to enhance the on-page strategy and figuring out, okay, what are we doing that's working? What are our competitors doing that, that, that are outranking us that we can learn from and do a little bit better? What are some people in other industries doing that are unrelated to ours, but, but that's pretty cool that we could start learning? And we're always looking for ways to productize the SEO. The, 
then, and it's not easy, it's hard. But one of the classic examples of this is the Zillow Zestimate. And if you're in the United States, Zillow has has a thing called a Zestimate for every single property in the United States where you can go on there and they have crunched the numbers on the sales data on that piece of property. They can tell you what the property is worth. And so we're always looking for ways, how do we productize what it is we do in such a way that, that we can offer value to, to, to searchers when they're searching for lawn care services or related topics where we can use our data and productize it. So that's what we're working on now in terms of, okay, this is what, based on our data, it should cost to, to mow your yard every week. Based off of 45,000 transactions in your zip code, this is what it's going to cost. Here's five contractors who can do it for that price. And so that's what we're working on now and looking for ways to leverage our first party data, the data that's coming through our platform that only we have, and then take that and then productize that and put that forth into to Google so Google can surface it for searchers and we can reward searchers unlike anybody else. And so that's like the Holy Grail. That's what we're working on now. But you're always looking for ways to you're always looking for inspiration from competitors and also people in other industries that are just kicking butt at SEO and, and trying to borrow from their strategies to, to up-level what it is you're doing. Yeah, makes sense. And because your business nature is such that local SEO is something which, which is a must-do, right? And I'm sure like you must be putting in a lot of focus to ensure that your visibility is actually very high on local search results, city-based results, or locality-based results, all of those things. How exactly do you proceed with that? What that process looks like? Yeah, local SEO is, is probably, local SEO probably shares 50% in common with just a general SEO strategy. And then the other 50% is unique and different things you have to do. And it's just a different set of things that, that have to be done and a different different skill set, different, different, different people doing different things. For us, it starts with, okay, where do we have a little local office? We maintain a little local office in, in about 30 different cities throughout the country. And th these are places where vendors can come and they can get help if they need it. If there are places where we have a local support person that can help if there's an issue. And so if we have a local office, we will then do local SEO. And so that starts with things that have been the same for 10 or 15 years. You get a Google My Business location and you start building signals around that. And then you build uh, you build references and citations around that. Although that stuff doesn't matter as much as it did five or 10 years ago, it still matters. And then the other thing is local reviews and then making sure all that stuff is consistent across every piece of the property in terms of the landing page and all of that. And then also local press. We reach out to the local press and talk about, hey, we've got a contractor who's a single mother who started mowing grass on Green Pal in March, and now here it is October. She's got 10 employees. She she paid off her medical debt, and she just bought a home. That's a pretty cool story. You want to write a story about it? And so we reach out to the local press, and then the local press does a story about about this kind of feel-good story, and, and it doesn't have to be contractor-focused. It could be like, hey, winter is coming up. Here's 10 things you should do in Buffalo, New York to get your home ready for winter based off of a survey of Green Pal contractors. And, and so the local press will cover it and link back to the local page. And so local SEO is a little different. It's not rocket science. It's just a lot of manual work. That makes sense. And also one of the things, Brian, that I've seen a lot of brands struggle is link building, especially when you're working with an in-house team. Scaling link building activities Getting good authoritative backlinks pointing to you. And you know that's a very critical factor, right? So ensure that your page ranks on the top uh, for your targeted keywords. Uh, how exactly is that process in your country? I think that link building is important. And some people say it's not important. I think it's still important. I think, especially in the age of Chat GPT, that I think mentions and links are going to be one of the most important things because in a world where all the output, all the information, all of the text is commoditized. How do you know what's authoritative and not? And so I think links are going to become more important than ever. It's just a theory of mine. But so link building has been important for us since day one. And in the way we do it is not scalable. It's very, it's founder led. My, my two co-founders and I still build links every single day, whether it be reaching out to journalists and talking about 
ways that we can help them with stories they're working on. Press mentions is very much of a press led, uh, like a, a PR led link building strategy, I guess you could call it, where we reach out to the press and we talk about things that we're doing that they might want to write about. But it's not scalable and it's really hard and we've just done it one link at a time. And, and I don't know of a way to scale it. I, I, one thing I do know is like the traditional, uh, link building in a sense of spray and pray and you spam a bunch of people and beg them for links. I'm pretty sure that's a waste of time. I've been doing this for 12 years and I get 50 of those a day and I block and delete and report spam all of them. I've never built a link that way and I've never added a link. So I think that's probably a waste of time. Yeah. I think it. I think whatever time and money you're spending doing that, I think you should put that back into the content and maybe rather than reaching out to 10,000 people spamming them, reach out to 20 and really just write them a really good pitch and have something really good for them. I know that's that's probably a waste of time too because you may just go over oh, 20. Um, but I think it goes back to, this is really cliche, but like just focus more on on what it is you're pitching and not the pitching itself i could i I think that link building in a sense of like just spray and pray is probably a waste of time yeah it makes sense sense. in fact like there's a lot you actually very correctly mentioned this that of reaching so many people just be picky about there's a lot of quality parameters that needs to be checked in before reaching any of the prospect out to be honest their own sites quality parameters whether that link would actually do good to you or harm. So you yeah. need to make sure that those being taken care of before approaching. And once it does a good fit, why not? If the pitch is good, there are a lot of platforms also out there now, which really helps you well. We are also about to come up with an influencer platforms that will have exhausting less jobs, active bloggers whom you can reach out and just approach and have that link pointing back to your site and the, the content needs to be in line with those bloggers and all of those things. Anyway, this is what guest posting each and it's all of those things that but yeah. All right. Um would love to know now what are what are the current regions that you are operating right now and what's the future plan for expansion? Also can you share some of the insights into the company's vision and future plans of growth and development? Yeah, we're in North America now, United States now, all any major city in the United States, any town that has over 15 or 20,000 people, you can use GreenPal to get a lawn mowing service. And we're spending the next year probably focusing on how do we get more, how do we get the flywheel spinning faster in the places where it's not? So for example, a Huntsville, Alabama will do more transactions than a Seattle, Washington. And Seattle, Washington is probably 30 times the size of Huntsville. So why is that? Why is it that this town so, that's so much smaller is generating more transactions than this other city that's bigger? It's because we we haven't really got the flywheel going in this other city. So there's no reason to go to any new territories until we figure that out. So we're working on that. After we get that kind of figured out, then we're going to move into Canada, UK, Australia, but that may be another year or two internet internationalizing a marketplace like this is a lot harder than i thought it would be it's there's a lot more to it these invisible lines between us are very real and and things are different from country to country although you wouldn't think much is different between the united states and canada in terms of how things are done for some reason it is and (laughs) that's going to happen but we have more more low-hanging fruit higher priorities before we do that gotcha and uh now, I would love to know, because as it was the primary channel that you leverage, what are the KPIs that you keep track of for, to make the important decisions or, or the areas we should focus on? And yeah, wait, let's talk about the KPIs that you monitor primarily. I hear a lot of SEOs talking about how you shouldn't r- rank, how you shouldn't track page rank as a KPI, like where you're ranking on the page for certain keywords. Oh, don't worry about that. And I think that's bullshit. I mean, no, that's very, it's, it's very important. Like that's one of the only things. And so I don't know if that's like a myth that's being, if that's a myth that's being disseminated by SEOs because they're tired of being anchored against that and they can't really control that. And it's, they work for a client and page rank goes through the floor and they're like, then I'm not paying your, 
you know, not paying this fifty thousand dollars a month anymore. So they're trying to put out this this myth that page rank doesn't matter, like where you rank on the search engine results page. I so think I think that's very, I think it's very important. Like I, we track the hell out of that. That's yeah. critical. I think the reason they say this is for for the fact that say for example, if you're ranking, you're targeting. Uh, you promise a client that targets each keywords. Now there will be tons of secondary keywords, long phrase keywords that will be ranking, and that sometimes becomes hard for the service providers uh, to track all of them, all the subsets of it. So maybe that's the reason. Maybe avoid that right. thing. But I agree with you. It's very crucial. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. So that's a critical one. We, which where are we ranking on the pages for? Uh, maybe because ours is just so much simpler. Where where do we rank for lawn mowing services, Nashville, Tennessee? Like we we need to rank one, two, or three. And if we're not, there's something wrong. Uh, so we track that. Track sales. Sales by market. That's huge. And it, and we can tell sales and transactions go down whenever we're adversely affected by a Google algorithm change. And so that's what huge. What analytics do you use for this purpose? Are you gonna what, what does analytics tool do you use? For uh, we like for local, we like WhiteSpark. I have tried like hell, it's expensive, but I have tried like hell to get SEM Rush or Ahrefs or, or five other tools to show me the local ranking data. But WhiteSpark is the best local SEO tool that I have found. Thank you. And but we also use SEM Rush and Ahrefs and pay for their premium stuff as well because each of them are good at one little thing. And so we we track sales by market, we track page rank, we track on page conversion by market by market, and about two or three other things. But we don't get crazy with it. We don't like real like we know pretty well if we're doing good or if we're not, or it's something that we shipped improved ranking or didn't. And we don't really. We're a small team. We're only like 40 something people and the growth team is around 14 people. And so it's not like we can just, it's not like we have a hundred or 200 or 500 people that can pour over this stuff. We try to keep it simple and we look at a few metrics that we can focus on and move and don't really worry about anything else. Makes sense. And because on a page is pretty much that you know, and link building bits in a little bit on that front, but yeah, mainly you focus on the on page. Is there a way you track the content refresh rate for your competitors to keep your content also aligned with what they've been doing and stuff? Is that something you're focusing on or not? I used to, but then that got me in trouble. We used to have a competitor that was, <laughs> they were kicking ass at creating all of this content that was like link bait. And so they would create content like the top 10 best pizza restaurants in Dallas, Texas. And man, they would get all of these links uh, and it was like a, inter it was like a, it was like a, a survey that they would run and they would just create all this content. I'm like, man, that's working. They're getting all these links, their domain authorities going up, but that had nothing to do with the lawn care industry. And so I started to copy that a little bit and then like they got slammed by an algorithm update and then I got hurt by it too. And then I made a decision from then on, I wasn't even going to look at any more competitor stuff. I was just going to, I was just going to glance at it. And really look at not necessarily my competitors, but like the real powerhouses in other industries. What is Nerd Wallet doing for credit cards? What is Indeed.com doing for job listings? What is Yelp doing for small businesses? And, and really trying to look at those powerhouses. These are multi billion dollar companies and trying to learn from them and not necessarily worrying about like competitors that were at my level. Makes sense. Uh, we're coming to your end, Brian, and uh, I would love to have a quick rapid fire view. Are you ready for that? Sounds good. Okay. What habit holds you back the most? What's holding us back? We're self funded. We always have been, and so it's yeah. As a startup founder, you're all you're wearing the hat of a capital allocator. So a little bit of money comes in, and then you put money to work, and then some stuff works out, some stuff doesn't. You make bets. Some some pan out. Some don't. So what's holding us back is always resources. If at any given time, if you gave me a million or $10 million, I could put it to work. Yeah. But then on the other hand, I don't want to, I don't want to like, I don't want to raise any capital because I don't want any people dictating what it is we do. And, and I, we've been very lucky to not raise capital. It's one of the reasons why we're still here today. And so it's always people you want to hire. There's always two or three key people you want to hire that, that make, that, that, that make really good salaries. And so that's hard. And so, yeah, that's always been what, what's, what's held us back, but that's what makes it challenging. And that's what makes it fun figuring out unique ways to solve these problems.
Makes sense. Now this will be personal. What chore do you absolutely despise doing? I'm more of a creative, shoot from the hip, gut level kind of guy. Let's take action. Let's, you got an idea, let's try it out. I'm not really an analysis, spreadsheets, pour over the data kind of guy. And so I hate really pouring over spreadsheets and it doesn't matter if it's a, if it's a, <laughs> if it's a financial model or if it's a spreadsheet of a thousand landing pages and, and yeah. 10 different attributes across all of them. I hate that stuff, but I, I employ people that are really good at that stuff who I then have regular weekly check-ins with where, where it forces me to, to be good at that stuff. So it's a tripwire. It's, it's like a, a, a a forcing function that causes me to do the stuff that I don't want to do. Okay. What subject do you find to be most fascinating? I love the the subject of, of behavioral economics. So it's okay. Some you know, one little weird thing we changed about the presentation of an offering caused it to increase. It's books that Robert Cialdini uh, wrote influence and and i can't remember the name of the second book with the orange cover predictably irrational no that's not that's a different guy anyway pre, robert Childani and the book predictably irrational are really good books about behavioral economics and weird things that people do when they're presented with offerings in a different way and so like that the concept of price anchoring like you look at a if you go to a restaurant you look at a menu there is a, there's a $10, there's a $15 steak and there's a $25 steak. And then there's a $130 steak and nobody orders the $130 steak, but just its presence there drives the sales of the $25 steak because people are anchored against that. And they say, well, that's not a, this is, I'm not doing that, but that makes this look pretty good. So Sweet. weird stuff like that. It fascinates me. I'm like a novice at it, but I'm always interested by that stuff. Right. Now, coming to my very last question, what was your last Google search? Oh, let me see. I am trying to book a trip for New Year's to St. Bart's. And so my last Google search was Googling best routes, how to get there, stuff to do there, just research. I've never been there. And, and so it's funny. I don't know how ChatGPT is going to replace all of that all of the nuance around trying to figure out a new place to go is so much based on opinion and gut and different kind of signals and different resources and different places. And it's like you, as a traveler, you bring all of this in, you collate it, and then you come up with your decision. And I don't know that chat GPT can replace all of that. And it's interesting. I've tried some of these chat GPT products for, for travel. They all suck, but maybe one day they won't. Maybe one day they'll yeah, be yeah. incredible. Maybe maybe one day they'll be incredible and they'll know what I like and they'll know what I'm looking for. I hope because it's a real drag trying to figure out things about a place you've never been and trying to make your best bet based on what you find on 20 Google searches. But yeah, that was my last one. Brothers, thank you so much, Brian, for all the information, all the wisdom that you've shared on uh, this session. I really appreciate your time here. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thanks for having me on.